Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mary McKelvey. I'm a trial lawyer, a litigator, and a partner at Polsonelli. I currently serve as the president-elect of Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles and an officer of California Lawyers Association lit litigation section and a proud member of the uh, CLA Racial Justice Committee. As some of our lawyer audience may know, California Lawyers Association, or what I will refer to as CLA, was formerly the state bar. And since splitting off from the state bar, it has become an even stronger and more dynamic institution. For those lawyers among us who are attending tonight, we encourage you to become more involved. Being a CLA member is pretty easy. When you receive your state bar dues, you have the option to check what section you wanna be a part of, the litigation section, the criminal law, environmental, et cetera. And we encourage you to confirm your membership and get more involved. The Racial Justice Committee of California Lawyers Association was formed about a year ago. And it was during one of these meetings that the idea for this series of discussions was formed and this Roots of Racism series was born. We have our co-founders with us tonight, Adrianette Ciccone and Terrence Evans. And uh, it has just been an amazing uh, institution. Our first panel in this series, which we're presenting this evening, will focus on how systemic and institutionalized racism has been woven into nearly every aspect of America and how it continues to impact people in the present. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on systemic racism from the perspective of our black communities. Many of us are only recently learning and getting the full true American history lesson for the very first time. And it is our goal and our hope that by understanding the past, we can better evaluate the present and more wisely build toward a future of what we would hope to see as a true racial justice. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel, which is a, an unbelievable panel of um, women. And uh, I'm just, I, I can hardly wait to hear them all together. I'm gonna start with Professor Shauna Marshall. She's a professor of law at the University of California Hastings College of Law, where she currently teaches race, racism and American law a highly respected professor. She began her career as a trial attorney for the US Department of Justice. She worked for about 15 years as an attorney fighting for the public interest. She spent several years in the Stanford and East Palo Alto area, lecturing in the areas of civil rights and community law practice um, at Stanford Law School and directing the East Palo Alto Community Law Project. She was also the academic dean at Hastings for about eight years the co-founder of Hastings Center for Racial and Economic Justice. And for all of these people, I could tell you, I could spend literally an hour giving you their background. I'm giving you an extraordinarily truncated version. She's received uh, several titles in recognition of her academic work. Her greatest joy is in mentoring future social justice advocates. And she seems to be quite effective at it. As one of her students says, I only wish I would have met Shauna earlier in my law school career. She has inspired me to fight for justice. My experience with Professor Marshall is she really is that rare combination of brilliance and down to earthiness. I don't know if that's a word, but it is tonight. Uh, that makes her just a remarkable and perfect choice for this panel. Thank you for your participation, Professor Marshall. I next want to introduce Dawn Schock. Dawn is a lawyer, former president of California Women Lawyers, and she currently serves as a consultant to US government on projects implementing international rule of law, including reforming legal systems in the Middle East and beyond. Specifically, she's trained mediators and lawyers in Kosovo, Armenia. She's worked with law schools in Jordan to establish clinical skills classes. She supported women's empowerment programs in Tunisia, Qatar, Turkey, Morocco, and elsewhere. Most recently, she's developed and been teaching a professional skills seminar to women law students in Saudi Arabia. She is also an author of an article, This Land, Your Land, My Land, a powerful article exploring the history of racial disparity and land ownership in this country through various homestead acts by tracing the roots of her own white ancestors and their immigration to this country and the privilege, the privilege conferred as a result. 
I have to say personally about Dawn, she introduced me to to service and women's bar associations when I was still in law school and has been a great mentor to me in that area. She is truly an amazing and brilliant woman and I'm honored to call her a friend whom I've known for over two decades. Dawn, thank you for being a part of our panel tonight. And our final panelist who needs really no introduction is Dr. Shirley Weber, our Secretary of State. And as I read through the materials and I've been honored to have her on a panel before, I'm always just sort of struck with where do I start? I, I've never been prouder to be a Californian as I am today with Dr. Weber as our Secretary of State. She was sworn into office in January of 2021 after serving four terms as an assembly member representing California's 79th Assembly District. Let me tell you a fun fact is that after being elevated to Secretary of State, her daughter, the doctor, Dr. Akila Weber ran to replace her mother in the 79th district and won. So I just, I loved that. Her achievements are numerous. Her educational background and accomplishments are incredibly impressive, but it's who she is as a person that is most striking to me. Her life is simply an inspiration and a testament to the unlimited possibility that accompanies fearlessness, faith, and determination. Described by someone who works with her as an absolute commanding force that is unstoppable and woe to the person who gets in her way. She is not afraid of power and not afraid to use it. She is an inspiration to all of us. And I think you will agree after you've heard from her. And finally, it is my true pleasure to introduce my friend and the moderator for tonight, Terrence Evans. Terrence, so he's the perfect person to moderate this panel, I must say. He is a partner at the prestigious Dwayne Morris Law Firm, where he practices in the international, national, and community financial services industry. He also serves as the chair of the California Lawyers Association, or CLA, as I've mentioned, litigation section. He is a co-founder, as I've mentioned, of the CLA Racial Justice Committee. He also serves as the vice president of the Charles Houston Bar Association. And impressively, he was recently awarded as one of the top 40 under 40 lawyers in California, a very prestigious award. But I have to say about Terrence, that not only is he a skilled and masterful attorney, he is an inspirational leader and just a passionate and intensely thoughtful human being. I am really, truly honored to count him among my friends. So Terrence, why don't you get this party started? Uh, thank you, Mary, and, and thank you so much to the amazing panelists that we have here. Uh, it is an honor to uh, be able to present this information that's so important at this time. Before we get started, I want to thank some folks and also some organizations that helped to make tonight possible, starting with our planning committee, uh, Mary McKelvey. Uh, just thank you for all the incredible work you've done, Adrian Ciccone, Carl Chamberlain, Lauren Oakley, Leslie Levely, uh, uh, and Brianna Hollingsworth. We want to just thank all of you uh, for the work you've done. And additionally, uh, Teresa, uh, we want to thank you for your work. We also want to recognize uh, several sponsoring bar associations and law firms that helped to make tonight possible. Uh, we want to thank Dwayne Morris, uh, the Polsonelli Firm, the California Lawyers Association Racial Justice Committee, the litigation section of the California Lawyers Association, the Charles Houston Bar Association, the California Association of Black Lawyers, Region 9 of the National Bar Association, California Women Lawyers, Queens Bench Bar Association, California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles, Women Lawyers of Alameda County, Black Women Lawyers of Northern California, and the University of California Hastings Law School. I think of all the many programs that we've done, uh, this is probably the largest number of sponsors that we've had, and we're so grateful for the support that you've provided. Uh, for all of those in attendance, this is part of a series of diversity and inclusion programs that the California Lawyers Association Racial Justice Committee has been putting on. Uh, following the death of George Floyd, and we of course just recognized the anniversary of his passing, 
Adrianette and I and several other co-founders decided that we had to do something to address racial injustice in California. And so we formed this committee. And in the past year, we've had over 100 programs focused on diversity, inclusion, and racial justice. Tonight's program is the first in a series of programs that look at systematic racism. Uh, tonight's program will focus on the Black community. We will also be doing programs focused on the Latinx Hispanic community, the Asian community, the Native American community, uh, and others. Tonight's program will focus on three different time periods. The first time period will focus on our country's beginnings. The second time period will look at the post-Civil War era. And the third time period will focus on the post-World War II and civil rights movement. Um, for each of these periods, you're gonna hear from Professor Marshall uh, and then the other panelists uh, about the impact that these periods have had on racial justice, diversity and inclusion in our country. I'd like to, before we begin, just share my screen for a second because I think it's important to put all of this in context. The discussion that we're having tonight about civil rights, racial justice, diversity and inclusion would be illegal in at least 12 states. So I want you to take a look at this uh, map of the United States that I put up here. Uh, in the red, you see states that have already banned programs like what we're having tonight. And in the purple, you see states that are uh, presently uh, pushing through legislation that would make what we're doing tonight, this conversation tonight, illegal in public schools and many public universities. In some of these states, uh, for having the conversation we're having tonight, teachers can be fined up to $5,000. And in some of these public universities, if they were to invite the amazing guests that we have tonight, uh, those teachers could be putting their uh, tenure in jeopardy. So I just want folks to understand that not everywhere in the United States are people able to freely have this discussion. And we're extremely fortunate uh, to be able to, to discuss these issues in, a, in an open and honest way. So without further ado, uh, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Marshall who will start us off with the first time period discussing our country's beginnings. Professor Marshall. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone um, for including me in this amazing program. That map that you just displayed was really pretty frightening because I often feel that the way in which we whitewash, and I use that word deliberately, our history is one of the reasons that we are unable to really develop remedial structures to undo the lasting legacy of our system of racism. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the founding of our country from a black perspective. In 1619, when the first slaves were brought to this continent, it was not a foregone conclusion that we would have race-based slavery in perpetuity that would be passed on from generation to generation. In fact, some of the first Africans who were brought here were treated a bit like white serfs and were able after a certain period of time to get their own land, which is why during slavery, we had some free blacks who owned land. Many historians believe that race-based slavery was put into effect after Bacon's rebellion. So who was Bacon? Bacon was this white landowner who was actually not a very good guy. He wanted the governor of Virginia in the late 1600s, around 1676, to be harder in its dealings with Native Americans to get more land. And when the governor refused to do that, Bacon put together a army that consisted of poor white serfs, poor black serfs and black slaves. And that army destroyed the Virginia militia and burned down Jamestown. It took months for the Virginia militia to overcome what had happened um, with Bacon's army and to put them down. And it scared the white 
plantation property owners. They realized there and then that a combination of poor whites and poor blacks and slaves working together could dismantle their plantation system. And what did they do? They decided they would divide and conquer. And they began the narrative, which they fed to white people, that you are superior to black people and that black people are brutes, they're unintelligent, they're like farm animals. And they began the, the implementation of what we then learned to be our race-based slavery. They did this in a number of ways. In addition to creating the narrative, they passed laws in early Virginia and Maryland. And again, this is before we are a country. And those laws made it a crime for whites to fraternize with blacks. They would lose their land opportunities if they married a black person, they were banished from the community. Moreover, they imposed incredibly, incredibly brutal rules on black slaves. Black slaves were no longer able to learn to read or were never able to learn to read or write. They were considered property. That property right was enforced by the courts. If a black slave was injured or damaged, there would, because of his slave owner, there would be no criminal prosecution because after all, the slave was a piece of property. Then they developed laws that said if a slave tried to run around, run away, his ears or limbs could be chopped off. He or she could be killed for trying to incite any kind of riot. Free blacks were not allowed to hire whites. Free blacks were not allowed to own weapons. And any congregants of black people together could result in death. So they both created this narrative to separate poor whites from blacks. And they, they made the hammer, um, the laws that were developed before we were a country. So that is where we were as our nation was formed. And as our nation was formed, our constitution had three provisions that allowed for slavery, even though the founding fathers knew slavery was a horrible term and a pernicious system, so they never used the word slave in the Constitution. But what the Constitution did, it allowed Southern states, slave states, to count three-fifths of their African population in their total. What did that do? It gave them more electors for the electoral college when there were presidential elections. It gave them bigger congressional districts. So you have three fifths of a population that can vote embedding great power in Southern states right from the inception. There was also a fugitive slave um, law put into our constitution. So if a slave ran away, to a state like Pennsylvania that didn't allow for slavery, Pennsylvania had to send them back. And finally in the constitution, you had the provision that said slavery could not be tampered with in any sort of way until 1809. Another really important law that was um, passed was making a child of a slave's lineage attached to her mother not to her father like every other law, but to her mother, thereby meaning that any child born of a slave stayed a slave, including children who were the product of rape by plantation owners. So you have this system and then you have our founding fathers who believed in this inferiority of black people. We all think of Benjamin Franklin as an abolitionist and he was, but not for the reasons we think. He wanted the United States to be an all white country. I don't know what he planned to do with the native people, but he wanted it to be an all white country and he thought slavery kept us from that goal. He also thought slavery would make whites lazy and lack industry. And then, of course, there's Jefferson, who was a great believer in the inferiority of Blacks. And he wrote in 1787 that there's no tenderness in their love, their grief 
is fleeting, their afflictions are less felt, they are intellectually inferior, and they are physically unattractive. And this was in 1787. Yet, as slavery endured and became harsher and more cruel, by 1824, he wrote a letter to Jared Sparks, who was a Unitarian minister. And you can tell he's now wrestling with a system that he helped create and maintain. And his new solution is to send Africans to slowly free us and send us back to Africa or repatriate us in the Caribbean. And he writes that the deep rooted prejudices entertained by whites and the thousands of memories of the injuries suffered by blacks will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one race or the other, which is really interesting because he worries that the result of this horrible system will be a race war. And he's not sure who's going to win even though he professes that blacks are inferior. So this is how we began, dividing whites from blacks and the cruelest perpetuation of a slave history system in the history of the world. And I'll end there. Uh, and Professor, I, I have a follow-up question, and that is, I've heard uh, Bacon's Rebellion is really the beginning of what we call whiteness in this country, where the, the poor whites were given a status uh, that was above that of the, of the African slaves. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you know, we came to understand what whiteness is in this country? Yes, and, and that's a really, rebellion. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question because the truth is, when people came to this country, they saw themselves from the ethnicity that they hailed. So the Anglo-Saxons, the French, you had African tribes, the Yorubas, the Ibus. No one really characterized themselves by a race. And after Bacon's rebellion, the Anglo-Saxon propertied plantation owners realized that we need these white serfs or these serfs from e European descent to be on our side. So they did two things. They told <clears throat> them, you're like us. And eventually maybe you'll own a plantation too. And what we will do is after you serve us, we will give you land. So they gave them this sense of entitlement and superiority. And they said, those Africans that you think are suffering like you, they're supposed to suffer. They're not really human. And you, you can see in 2020, one, this legacy of white, poor white people holding on to hate and a sense of superiority at the expense of their own economic success. And, and Professor, just another follow-up question. You were talking a few moments ago about free Blacks. Uh, and I guess this is something that I've always wanted to know. How did free Blacks distinguish themselves from enslaved Blacks? And what I mean by that, uh, looking at their face, you know, looking at how could you tell me from just a slave? Well, and see, that's what was so problematic. You couldn't. I mean, other than probably the manner in which the person was dressed because they weren't in the, those horrible sacks that they called clothing. But that was also what was so pernicious about the fugitive slave. It's very hard to prove your freedom. So oftentimes they were captured and enslaved because their credibility and their ability to testify in court was prohibited. Wow. Um, and what other types, so uh, as, as we look at what happened then and we kind of bring it to the present, um, how did these racial laws and narratives affect our founding fathers? And I think you gave some examples, uh, but are there any other examples that you can share with us about the impact on our founding fathers? Well, I, you know, it's really interesting. One of the reasons, uh, and everyone knows the Broadway um, show Hamilton, but one of the reasons Hamilton was also so um, um, 
at, at times disliked by the, the more uh, uh, gentrified founding fathers was because he was from the Caribbean and um, he didn't own land and people said, oh, is he really all European? And because he had grown up in the Caribbean, he had um, African friends and he didn't buy into the narrative that we were different and inferior. And that created even more of a rift between him and um, Madison, for example, as they were writing the Federalist Papers. Um, for Washington, he was another one who was a slave owner, believed in the um, inferiority of African-Americans. And it was one of the reasons he was willing, if not eager to allow for those provisions in the constitution that maintained slavery. Um, so those are just a couple of other examples. And, and when we talk about institutional racism, just based on the description you've given, it, it really seems like it has roots to the very founding of, of the country where black folks were not considered full human beings. And do you think that has any you know, uh, implications for us today? Well, we've never shed that belief. And, you know, we've, we've put a Band-Aid over the hemorrhaging of that belief, um, but it has never gone away. And it's been passed on from generation to generation. I'm just, you know, in the next part, when we talk about Jim Crow and the violence in that period, and it's been taught consistently, you know, the the fact that history is often taught by the victors is a real problem. And unlike at least what happened in Germany where the Germans decided we are going to teach the truth of the Holocaust, we have refused, we have refused to teach the truth of the treatment of native people, African people, Latino people, Asian American people, and on and on and on because we have a dual consciousness where we have this unbelievably lofty constitution and yet a history of racial exploitation and oppression that is, is unbelievable when you really learn your history. And so what we've done is we've rationalized the creation of the underclasses that are often people of color who are the victims of 400 years of systematic oppression. And, you know, Trump just took the lid off of it once again, but it's always been there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And I'd like to expand the discussion a bit. Uh, and, and Dr. Weber, I, I know that you were the founder of the Africana Studies uh, Program at San Diego State, uh, and you were really and have been a pioneer in having the type of discussion that we're having now. And I, I wanted to get your reaction to what we're seeing around the country, uh, which is uh, this resistance uh, and this uh, effort to chill uh, conversations about race and slavery and the real life experience of people of, of color in this country. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, and, and obviously thank the, uh, the the dean for her um, uh, tremendous amount of information with regards to the laws and 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 what has happened in, in terms of African Americans. You know, it is um, uh, as as we approach this discussion of of, of truth about information, uh, it's interesting because. Um, uh, we are beginning to see folks who don't want to hear the truth. And, 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 and it's interesting that you mentioned these uh, things around the nation because, um, you know, part of the, 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 the lid on, on keeping uh, the truth out of really is the institutional racism that we exist in. Who makes those decisions about the information that is being, sh being shared? You know, the interesting thing, this past year, uh, 1460 was the, the bill that I did that met, met required ethnic studies. Uh, for every graduate of the Cal State University uh, system, which is a half a million students. And, um, and it's not a diversity studies and all that other stuff. It's really the, the discussion of, of African-Americans and Latinos and Native Americans and API communities in California. And, um, and so it's interesting that at a time when we're doing that and we're demanding it, and, and interestingly enough, today on the floor of the assembly was the, 
was a, a comp, uh, the, the uh, a bill that it should accompany it, which is about K-12 education and bring it into those because you know, without that truth and information that's being there, then it leaves it open for the continuation of uh, not just the narrative and the lies, but the behavior that comes with it. You know, when I, when I, when, um, you know, when, when at George Floyd's uh, execution, uh, you know, it was really quite interesting because um, in that I, I reminded folks that, you know, uh, if you really look at the book Without Sanctuary that has all the stories of lynchings in this country and how we made lynching a party and an activity that families could attend. And, and so what in the process, we have, we have seared our conscience toward the pain of African-Americans. And so what we saw in George Floyd, finally people saw on television uh, for, those, for those minutes that were there, we have seen that and experienced that forever. And people have ignored our pain and our cry for, for some sense of justice. And, um, and so now it's, it's visible on television, okay? So people have, you know, people can do things, but they, they'll do small things like, you know, they'll convict the guy who did it, but then these things still continue and, and it's still there. And so there's a sense that, that we, can, we, can, we can patch these things up with small things without realizing how deep the, the situation is, how deep the, the, the lack of knowledge, how deep the, the hatred and the pain is with regards to African-Americans. And it, and it permeates every aspect of society, you know, that when I, I look at schools and I say, hey, why are black kids, you know, at the bottom all the time, yet the data shows other kinds of things. Well, it feeds that narrative, that continuing narrative that these, these kids, this is the best these kids can do, you know, because when you think they can do better, what you, you, you demand more. And so our school system doesn't man, demand enough because they've already made up their mind that they are not like other kids. They're not a part of other kinds of situations. And you hear this on a regular basis. And, and the interesting thing with, as, as she's pointed out with the beginning of this issue of race, it, it defies all logic and all rationale for this country when you look at it. Um, you know, here you have folks who were working and right alongside of people who were doing the same kind of work with the same kind of interest and relationships. And immediately you can create a narrative that, that turns them against each other, that makes one a brute. brute. You can, you can take individuals who are very intelligent and doing things and you can turn them into maybe maybe the exception to the rule, but surely not the norm. And, and you, can, you can do these things in a very systematic way that, that defies everything. You know, it, it, always the history or the, the lineage of a, of a child in, in, a, in, a, in a patriarchal society is always tied to the father. But when it's to your benefit, you can tie it to the mother. Why? To keep black men from having relationships with white women, because that's going to be rare and you're not going to do it. But it allows black white men to practice and to also uh, engage in anything they want with African American women and produce more slaves. So that defies all of the definitions of religion and, and lineage and all this other kind of stuff. They can take their, their own concept of Bible and turn it into some situation that makes you a slave and an owner to your master and, and ignore all the other aspects. And so what has happened, it's really interesting to me as, a, as I've studied over the years is that they can, they can take every rule that they have, even write a constitution that all men are created equal and then define you as not being a man. Even though the evidence, as Frederick Douglass pointed out, is, is it evident by every other animal walking the streets. He said, even a dog knows you're a man, you know, a, a, a cow knows you're a man. He doesn't respond to you as a cow, he responds to you as a, as a human being. And yet they can take all that and people can believe it. You know, they can believe, oh, you can't teach uh, an African-American to read, and yet they do. And so what I found over the years is that these things that they have said that are inconsistent with facts are still being played out. When I was in a meeting once, that when I was a president of the school board in San Diego, with the teachers union, they would, we would talk about the achievement of black kids. And one of the persons says, I wish you folks could do for black, black kids, black parents would do for black kids what Asian parents do for their kids who come here from Vietnam and so forth and so on. And he said, I said, what is that? You know, have a value for education. And he went on. And so I had to stop him right there in the conversation. I said, let me ask you a question. How many Vietnamese colleges do you know? He said, none. I said, how many Latino colleges do you know? He said, none. And I went through the list and I said, how many black colleges do you know? He said, oh yeah, he started naming them off. I said, so you're gonna tell me, given the fact that the only ethnic group in this country that has spent time developing colleges for higher education for their children because you've denied that to them, that they don't have a value, value for education. That is totally inconsistent, totally inconsistent with any group of people in terms of what their values are. 
And so, so what this what this whole thing has done, and, and, and that's why it's so important as we talk about information, we have to unravel this stuff. This stuff is so interwoven in people's thinking and behavior. And it, and it goes over 400 years of who we are, what our aspirations are, what limitations they think we have. And it goes on and on. And these over expectations for us that they know we'll never meet and those kinds of things are really clear. And as a result, they have a tendency to impact all the policy, all the regulations, everything else. When we were doing AB 1460 to try to get ethnic study approved at the Cal State University, I have to celebrate the governor for that because the institution had decided every rule that they had about why it should not happen. But it all hinged upon one thing, that the chancellor of the system didn't want it. And that's his responsibility to make those critical decisions along with the board of trustees. And they didn't want it. And here we were, the legislature saying, yes, it's going to happen. And I told the governor, you, you, this is institutional racism. This is, this is saying this institution can block any progressive thing we want, even though we know it's right. I said, so if you believe in fighting institutional racism, here is your chance. Here is your chance to sign this bill because they have no reason, no, no rationale for denying it. We worked with them for years and even their own committee had come out and said, you need a three unit requirement of ethnic studies in the system. And they still did not want to do it. You know? and, and much of it was, some of it was curriculum, but they never talked about curriculum, but it was really economic because once you allow that to happen at that institution, you've got to hire people to teach those courses. You've got to increase the number of black faculty, Latino faculty, Asian faculty, on those campuses who can teach those courses. That's an economic issue. That's an investment in the future. That is a change in the ivory tower, okay? And so, so it was interesting. So the governor signed it. They were, the, they were all shocked. I said, you, if you're gonna fight institutional racism, here is your chance to do it. This is your chance to be courageous because there is no logic behind it. They had given all these questions about, well, it's academic freedom, which is not what it's about. And they went through this whole thing. And I answered every question. And I said, let me tell you the problem they made. The problem was they let me be a full professor for 40 years at San Diego State University. They, I served on every committee there was, including the Academic Senate. <laughs> so I know the arguments backwards and forwards. I know the arguments they're gonna make. And I also know the exceptions to the rules that they have often applied for themselves. Now that's the first mistake they made. They let me stay there long enough to learn the system and to use it to effectively move change for people that needed change. And so, so when we look at this, this whole issue, this is, this is such a, a, a huge issue. And that until we really get to the bottom and, and grapple with the issue of race in this country and, it's, and how pervasive it is in everything we do and, and, and stop running from it and embrace it, embrace it not in bits and pieces, but embrace all of it and its impact, you know, we will forever be struggling with this issue. And, and he was correct when he said, you know, this is gonna divide the nation. And it does when people get the information because they're unwilling to move forward and change. And as African-Americans, we have sometimes become complicit in it. I mean, I have African-Americans who tell you they don't like to look at certain movies. They don't wanna know about certain issues about race. They don't want to do these things. And I'm, and I'm saying to them regularly, they said, how can you look at all these movies? How could you read this material? I said, if you are going to, if you are at war, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you're at war and you think you're at peace. Right. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. And you have to acknowledge that you are in, at war for your dignity, for those who you who struggle so hard to give them just a chance to be equal. And if you don't recognize that and you go around thinking that the world is, is wonderful and it's all equal, you're going to be disappointed in the worst kind of way. And it's gonna have an adverse effect, not only on you, but everybody that you're supposed to represent. So it is, a, it is an ongoing challenge. It is a struggle that's there, but it is, it is, is not impossible to change. And we have, to, we have to begin to dismantle the misinformation that people have about us, about our goals and aspirations, about our abilities and all those things. You know, I, I told the people on the floor of the assembly, I was, I was upset and, 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 and concerned because when we saw uh, Hidden Figures, the movie, that came out, I said, think of all the time we wasted trying to convince girls, first of all, and then black girls that they could do math. They had no role models, they had no history, they had no idea of knowing this. And so we had totally convinced women and young girls that they are not good at math, they're not good in science. 
And yet this whole enterprise of internet of, of space travel was based on four black women and a few other black women who worked with them. I mean, just think of the narrative that would have happened if the truth had been told. These women had been lifted up in society when they were alive. It was only one that was left living, could be lifted up and could be images and possibilities for, for women and for women of color in this country. And yet we crushed that information. We didn't allow it to be out that it was there. And we missed an opportunity to elevate generations of women to a point of excellence in a field that we have convinced them that is not their area of expertise. It is amazing wow. what we do. That's powerful. And, and Dr. Weber, if I can ask a quick follow-up question, and that is, what is the twofold benefit of having children of color learn about their history and who they are, and also having white children learn about the real racial history of this country? How do both sides benefit from having this type of information? Well, you know, having taught for 40 years at the university and seeing initially the benefits, of, even with, just with college students, first of all, it gives black people a place and a right to be because the world teaches us that we're beggars and that everybody has created everything and we have done very little, that we should be grateful just to be here, that there's, there's very little we have. And, and oftentimes we know that's wrong, but we don't have the information to prove it. We don't have the evidence to prove it. And we see the difference in what happens when young, young black folks go to black colleges versus white universities over the years. And we see how they come out with a stronger back and they're able to deal with the world because part of that history is in those institutions that they're there. And they see for the first time, black people who look like them who are doing excellent work in science and math and, and law and everywhere else where they don't see that at, at, at a white institution. I used to tell, uh, I told the president at, at um, I guess the chancellor at uh, UC, uh, UC San Diego that you take our best and brightest and make them dull. Our black college just takes those who are kind of diamonds in the rough and make them shine. And that is so true. And so what happens is that information empowers people. You know, the more I learn about myself and my family, the more I learn about my father's struggle, the strong, the, the more I know how strong I am and on what he has been through and how I appreciate the ground that I walk on based on what he gave me a space to be. But if you don't know the struggle of your people, then you have the message that somebody else gives you, which is generally not going to be a message of power and empowerment. It is important for white people to know that for themselves, because they walk around sometimes with a sense of, of arrogance occasion that is not based on factual information. And as a result, when then they become a weapon against themselves and against other people in which they exist. And, and, the, and the reality is this nation is becoming more and more people of color that they have to learn to live with and to, and to compete against as well. And so for them, it's a matter of really resurrecting themselves, the misinformation they have. Oftentimes I've discovered that many of them are, are relieved to know that there are people like themselves or people who work, walk on this earth who don't look like them, but who are equal in power and knowledge and in influence and find that comforting to know that they have, they have that we have this, this ability to have relationships. Uh, you, can't, you can't build this nation on misinformation. We've tried that year, uh, right one time after another and it always ends up in some level of revolt, some uprising, some level of destruction and, 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 and division, and, uh, and we cannot survive with this continuation of it. I think people have come to understand that. The question is whether or not they're willing to take the next step. Thank you so much. And that is a perfect segue right into the second time period that we're focused on tonight, uh, which is the post-Civil War uh, period. And, and Professor Marshall, if you could speak a little bit about this period in history. All right, I guess I'm unmuted. Um, um, I'll try, there's so much here and I'll try to do this succinctly. You know, um, right before the Civil War, we had the Dred Scott decision, which I think um, so fully captured the Southern narrative of hate and held that we were so inferior that there, we had, we African-Americans had no rights that a white person need to respect. And soon after that, we began the Civil War. And the Civil War ostensibly 
was fought to end slavery and afterwards the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments were passed. The 13th amendment, as we know, abolished slavery but it left a huge loophole. And that was for the exception of a crime committed. The 14th amendment was supposed to give the newly freed Africans equal protection under the law. And the 15th amendment was supposed to give us the right to vote. Now, right after the war, after 250 years approximately of slavery going back to 1619, there was Sherman's Order 15, which would have allocated 400,000 acres of land confiscated from the South and given it to the newly freed African Americans. The order went on to say that each one of those parcels should be divided up in 40 acre slots to either be given or sold to blacks and that black people should hire other black people who did not have the opportunity to get the 40 acres. It was an attempt at reparations right after the Civil War. And what happened? Well, we know what happened. Lincoln was killed, Johnson the racist became president, and the land was turned back over to slaveholders. Nonetheless, that little period of reconstruction, 12 years compared to 250 years, was incredible. When you think about the accomplishments that Black people made in that short period. We had um, a huge growth in the formation of our churches. We elected 16 Black people to Congress, and we set up, as Dr. Weber talked about, we set up educational institutions. Let me give you some stats. The AME Methodist Church had 20,000 members in 1856 before the Civil War. That grew to 75,000 members by 1866, one year after the war, and to 200,000 people by 1876. And the church's property increased sevenfold. Similarly, 150,000 African-American Baptists became a half a million by 1870. But I think one of the biggest accomplishments was our attempt to educate a population that had been forbidden from getting any education. In just 12 years after the Civil War, with the help of um, missionaries and free Blacks who came to the South to teach, in just 12 years, we had a half a million ch Black children in schools. Right, And we began the formation of numerous small and then growing black universities. But sadly, those 12 years were very short lived and the backlash soon took place. So what happens? The loophole in the 13th amendment. And you now have black codes and the black codes basically criminalize every activity that a black person does, including his or her inability to have a job. That was a crime in many Southern states. And what happens when you're convicted of that crime? You're sent back to slave masters to work for free on their plantations, right? And then of course, we segregated all of the facilities and the facilities used for black people were miserable and underfunded and unsafe. And we had the law of the land supporting that in Plessy versus Ferguson. And then we also know that this was all punctuated by a reign of terror, violence that is unbelievably pervasive. Archives now show that there were probably an average of two black lynchings a week in the South. And I wanna to read to you something and it's a little blood curdling that a man named Carl Schertz wrote. He was an abolitionist who went down into the South immediately 
as reconstruction was um, un, being undone. And this is what he wrote. Some planters held back their former slaves on their plantations by brute force. Armed bands of white men patrolled the country roads to drive back Negroes wandering about. Dead bodies of murdered Negroes were found on and near the highways and bypaths. Gruesome reports came from the hospitals. Reports of colored men and women whose ears had been cut off, whose skulls had been broken by blows, whose bodies had been slashed by knives. This is what was going on in the South. And Plessy, when it said separate but equal, it used police power. Remember that it said under the state's police power, we can force the separation of the races and bring that forward. Who's enforcing this in addition to the private vigilantes, police power. Um, and, and on top of it, we had unbelievable violence whenever there was a modicum of success by a black person. So for example, a common occurrence would be one of the few black farmers who actually was successful would try to sell their goods to the open market. Well, if the white owner wasn't willing to pay the price that the white, that the black farmer knew his goods were worth, that black farmer would often be lynched. And that was a way to let the community know you don't have any power here and you have to do whatever we want. We're about to remember the 100th anniversary of Black Wall Street massacre in Greenwood, Tulsa, right? But it was one of the worst, but it was not at all the only event. These kinds of attacks took place regularly in American cities, North, Midwest, and South. In 1906, a group of white um, working class men took over the black neighborhood in Atlanta and burned their banks, their insurance companies, their barbershops, their restaurants. This was a prominent black business street. This is 1906. And it is believed that a hundred black people were killed in that. In 1917, white hundreds of blacks were slaughtered by whites for taking their jobs. Now let's go back and think about the division of white serfs and white black people and how effective that was. When whites began to unionize what did the industrialists do? They hired those blacks fleeing the South. What occurred? We had the red summer of 1919. It started in South side of Chicago where white workers went and slaughtered black workers. It spread to DC. There was violence in Boston, New York, and in this little town of Elaine, Arkansas, there's estimated that between 150 and 250 blacks were killed. You notice the whites don't go after the industrialists, they killed the blacks. That message was steeped in. So we have this going on and yet we have Teddy Roosevelt as president, right? People think of him as a great progressive person. He never, pushed through any anti-lynching legislation. And he actually shared many of the racist views of his Southern mother, was threatened by the growth of black middle class. He even worried about Eastern Europeans diluting the white Anglo-Saxon race. So that is the period following the Civil War. Um, and the other case I wanna mention is the we talked about Plessy, which took away, took equal protection and interpreted by separate but equal. We also had poll taxes and literacy tests to keep people from voting, right? So we, you have the loophole in the 13th Amendment locking us up. 
you have the evisceration of the 14th Amendment with Plessy and the slaughterhouse cases, and then you have poll taxes and literacy tests to keep us from voting. So you have these amendments and quickly they are taken away. Thank you so much, Professor. That gives us a, a very helpful overview of what was going on at the time. And before we get into the next question, which will involve the Homestead Act, I'm just gonna share my screen for a second because I want folks to understand that these Jim Crow laws that targeted uh, non-whites uh, were not just simply laws that were in effect in the Southern states or even some of the Midwestern states, they were also in effect in California. Uh, and I'm just gonna quickly go through some of these. Uh, here on the list, we have laws that were enacted uh, between 1850 and 1947. Many were enforced until 1964. Uh, so number one, there were laws in California and much of the country that barred non-whites from testifying in any case where a white person was a party. So you can imagine if you're in a car accident, you can imagine if you are assaulted and the other party happens to be white and you're not white, you cannot offer testimony against the white person. Uh, barred non-whites from serving on a jury, barred non-whites from voting. We're thinking about what's happening now with a lot of the voting restrictions around the country. Barred non-whites from holding elective office, barred non-whites from serving as judges, barred non-white attorneys from questioning white witnesses, this was particularly troubling in California Superior Courts. Uh, this practice was eradicated in federal courts before it was in uh, uh, California state courts. But if you were a black attorney or attorney of color and the witness that you wanted to question happened to be white, they did not have to answer your questions. Barred non-whites from public schools, barred non-whites from buying, renting property, barred white non-whites from being buried in certain cemeteries, Barred non-whites from restaurants, hotels, theaters, pools, beaches. A lot of people just don't realize how pervasive this is. Uh, I remember my grandmother telling me a story uh, about how she went through a drive through when my father and his brother were little kids. This was in California. Uh, and she wanted to get them burgers. Uh, they placed their order when they got around to the window. Uh, they were told we don't serve uh, the N-word here. Uh, and they were not able to get those hamburgers. Uh, deny non-whites admission to bar associations. People wonder why we have so many affinity bar associations. It came out of necessity because non-whites could not be part of these bar associations. Barred non-whites from public transportation. This one, a lot of folks don't realize. Barred non-whites, barred black people from hospitals. My mother, all of her siblings uh, were born at home. Uh, if you were in an emergency situation, there are numerous examples of well-known Black folks, but even everyday Black folks need emergency treatment. You couldn't go to the hospital unless that particular hospital served non-whites and there might not be enough time to get there. Barred non-whites uh, from equal pay for equal work. You talked about the unions. Uh, you could be working the same job, the same everything, uh, but earning substantially less and not getting the seniority also barred non-whites from marrying whites. There are, there are cases, uh, I'm going to skip those, but there were uh, two California cases that I'm just going to um, uh, let folks know about these cases, uh, and we can talk about it some other time. People versus Hall involving uh, whether or not Asian uh, people who were not uh, defined in this statute would be treated like white people or black people. Uh, long story short, the California Supreme Court decided that Asian people would be treated like black people and they were barred from giving testimony against a white man that they witnessed kill uh, one of their friends. The other one, uh, People versus Aaliyah, uh, this case here uh, decided that uh, just uh, if somebody has Caucasian features, uh, they will be treated as white and treated as a competent witness. Uh, if you happen to go to a beach, lose uh, some of your fairness, uh, you will still hold on to your white privilege. And, as we talk about this, it takes us right into our next question uh, regarding the Homestead Act. Uh, and um, uh, Dawn, I know you have written about this extensively. I read about the uh, I read the article that you published in the California Litigation Journal about your family's experience and history that you trace with respect to the Homestead Act. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
be happy to. <clears throat> thank you, Terrence. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Mary and the other members of the committee for the privilege of participating tonight with Professor Marshall and Secretary Weber. Um, unlike my brilliant uh, uh, co-panelists, I do not bring a particular professional or uh, uh, even a um, uh, amateur expertise on the roots of racism to this discussion. Um, what I bring is a perspective and um, obviously the perspective of the majority dominant view of things. And um, in the wake of the George Floyd murder, it became clear to me as to so many that whatever I had done in support of social justice issues prior to that time was not adequate and that something else needed to be done. And um, so I simply followed the recommendation of uh, activists who said, look again at your own history. That's all, just that simple act. Um, and what I discovers, discovered is exactly what has been laid out here tonight. And that is the roots of our institutional racism, both in our written laws and in these narratives into which we are born and we act out. And some of us, unfortunately, as um, evidenced in the map that you began with, choose um, to take those narratives to the uh, great disadvantage of us all. But at any rate, my family, you know, now that we have this, this history of leading up to the Civil War and Jim Crow, my family had no contact with the United States whatsoever until the late 1880s, 1890s, when all branches of my family were either recruited or invited, enticed by the Homestead Act to move from Southern Russia. They were a group of, of ethnic German farmers in Southern Russia who came to the United States to gain two key commodities that were given to them, 160 acres of essentially free land and citizenship citizenship to the United States. They could earn their citizenship while they were living on that land, while they constructed a rudimentary building to improve that land and stay there for five years, and then it was theirs. At this time, you had four million, some four million recently freed enslaved black people desperate for resources, promised 40 acres, which was abruptly pulled away from them. So now they don't even have the promise or the hope of that. Those under the terms of the Homestead Act, let's look at the law itself, since the, the written law said that you could claim this land if you were a citizen or you were declared, you wrote an attestation that you were going to uh, be naturalized as a citizen. Well, when the uh, act came into being in, the, in 62, of course, the citizenship of black Americans was not settled. They were not eligible under that act. And the naturalization act that applied said that it only applied to white free people. So it was explicit, this was not a secret. And so as we, going even back later in time, as we had already moved indigenous populations off of this land through a variety of means, some of which were violent, and I know there's a separate panel that will discuss that, but as the indigenous native population was removed from the land, that land became public land of the United States and it was given away to white settlers under this combination of the Homestead Act and the Naturalization Act. And that provision that said that only white people could become naturalized citizens was in law until 1952. So this is not ancient history. One of the 
so that's my family's background. And one of the narratives that comes with that is this idea that, um, well, it's the voice that we all hear so often whenever we try to address issues of, of um, building a social safety net or affirmative action or reparations or just addressing the gross wealth and income inequality that exists today. But that's that narrative that my family worked hard. I worked hard for this. Why should I give any of it up? And attached to that, either expressly or impliedly, is the phrase to those people who are just looking for a, a hand up, who don't want to work hard the way we did. And so I had that voice in the back of my mind as I reexamined um, my history. And lo and behold, it's pretty apparent that the biggest giveaway, the biggest handout in American history occurred when these 270 million acres of the American West were shifted out of public ownership into private hands, into the hands of roughly 2 million households, all of whom but 3,500 were white. Only 3,500 of those households were black. And those, of course, had to come later after citizenship was settled. And, and Dawn, let me ask you a follow-up question. Yeah. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if we could go back in time and those 4 million slaves, I am the descendant of slaves, if those 4 million slaves had been able to take advantage of the Homestead Act, what would the economic impact have been for Black people in this country? Well, land ownership, first of all, is everything in that period of history, and it remains that way. That is so much a part of the American dream is to own land. But what happened through the generations of my family is those claims were worked. I mean, I know where one of the homesteads is. I've seen it. My grandmother grew up on it. I know all of her stories about growing up there. And I've seen the house, which is now in, in decrepit. But um, uh, that family had the land. They used that land as the collateral to buy more land. And they were great, successful farmers. Another branch of my family sold their land and used it to purchase a farm implement building in, or a business in town. And they became successful business persons in that town. Another branch used it to support higher education. They became lawyers. And so each generation of my family has built on the initial log jess of the land and the citizenship. So that would have happened for those 4 million previously enslaved persons as well. Um, instead, they were left destitute without any resources and uh, with all of these new laws that, you know, piled on top to make their situation worse and worse. Uh, thank you so much, Don. And, and Dr. Weber, this takes us to your personal story. Uh, I remember seeing you speak about your family's experience and your father leaving Hope, Arkansas to California because there was no hope there. Can you talk about the impact of, of, of segregation and discrimination against uh, Black folks uh, and uh, how that's uh, impacted our you know, wealth in this country? Well, it's 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 no uh, it's it's no um, small uh, thought that that the absence of a foundation and the absence of it of ownership of land, as what well, coupled with the laws and the rules and regulations that limited one's personal freedom, uh, continue to have an, a devastating effect upon on African Americans, and that's why we we're at a time where we have zero wealth basically in terms of generational wealth that's handed from group to group. Um, you know, if you if you were in the South as my fam family was, and you were, my dad was a sharecropper, and even though uh, my my aunt's husband turned out to be a doctor from Fist, and so he was able to buy some land, but the rules were real clear that if you were to have land, you had to work their land first. You were not free to work your land and to become prosperous as a business person. So my grandfather was forever 
arguing with individuals about, well, I got to go do my own crop because the sun is getting too hot and my crop is going to die on the vine. And, and, and the attitude was, no, you make sure that the white folks crop is taken care of first, that they are prosperous. And then if you have time, you can work your own. OK. And in, then once you work your own, they determine what you would get. So my father got was forever getting in confrontations about these issues of fairness and equality. And the last one in August of 51 was when he had a major confrontation at the, at the way station about what he was owed and what they wanted to give him. And it became a physical confrontation. And my father became a liability because he, because clearly in, in Arkansas, um, you know, they didn't want the uprising. They didn't want the talk back. They didn't want you to do these things. And so his family literally had to sneak him out of Hope, Arkansas in the middle of the night, put him on a train to come to California where my mother's mother had come years before. And so as a result, we remained there for three months under taunting, I understand. And eventually my father went to Art California, worked, he, my mother and her grandmother and uncle basically sent for the rest of us to come. And for us to leave, we had to also leave in the middle of the night because you owe the debt of whatever it was. And so if he was scheduled to work somebody else's land as well as his own, uh, it was gonna fall on my mother and the rest of the family to be able to do that. So we left as well. And, um, but my father was kind of a, a, you know, an interesting person because he went back to Arkansas every four years to face these folks to know that he was okay, that he was fine, that he was doing well in California. But, but it was that system and that degradation that my grandfather particularly always was so afraid of white people. He was so afraid, but I, and I have to have to remember that Elaine, Arkansas, I understand when you read the stories of the riots in Elaine, Arkansas was one of the worst in the country. For weeks, they, they, they went around looking to kill and to shoot black people. Well, my daddy was born a year before Elaine, Arkansas, and Hope is not that far from it. So, so the thought that these folks were, were roaming the, the neighborhoods and the streets killing folks was designed really also to create fear and terror in the hearts of those who were there so that they would not rise up, that they would always submit. They would always be there and available to them. So this whole system of Jim Crow laws that really limited what you could do, how you could talk, what you could say was, was, was so pervasive that, and, and then the fact that if you were a sharecropper, your sons owned your debt. So that uh, my, my father had four other brothers and they all eventually sneaked and ran away to, to other places in Kansas and places like that, because there was no way you were going to get out of this debt that you owe that they defined that you could work all year long and you could add up what you owe. And in the end, you could say, I'm, I, I have a profit only to be told by them that you don't have a profit and you don't have the right to argue against them because you don't have the right to be a person, period. And so this Jim Crow laws really in, in, encased African-Americans and particularly African-American males and, and kept them in a, a position of servitude. And so even if you own land, they could take it from you very quickly. They could change the deeds. Uh, I, I had some friends who finally litigated some mat matters in Texas that it took maybe 30 years to litigate for a family and get the land that they owned and the oil that was on the land that they had been taking for years. By the time they did it, the parents were deceased, the grandparents were deceased, and the children were in their 50s by the time they actually got this done. But they had to litigate it from California. They could not litigate it from Texas, okay, because they were not allowed to even go into court in those areas. And they had to have lawyers from here to go down there to deal with it. So it's that kind of um, uh, efforts to, to keep folks away from it, from land ownership. And so owning land was, was major. And that's why so many folks didn't own land. And when they had it, they not only in the South, but even in California, creating different kinds of laws. They talk about what happened in Chicago with folks who, who uh, they created these, these roofs that people could own land and they would constantly pay and pay and pay as if they were paying on to, 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 to get a down payment and never own the house, never got the land that they've been paying in for 20 and 30 years. I mean, because why? They understood that, that land would be the entree into economics. It would be the family's foundation. Oftentimes it's the only wealth that black people have, the only wealth that families have. And so when you begin to compare others who've had land that's intergenerational, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, Sean can talk about, uh, Dawn can talk about how she can go back and look at the land that her grandmother owned. And, and she can talk about how they parlayed these pieces of land into their future uh, uh, and, and, and the economic basis there. And so, you, so when you come to us and they start talking about us, us having zero wealth, it's, it's, it's the fact that we work every day and we own nothing. You know, we own very little at all. And as a result, we have very little to give to our children when we die. 
And uh, and so that's the inner, that's the struggle of 400 years. But I think it's interesting also because, and I, and I appreciate uh, Dawn's story because too often when we're talking reparations, people talk about, as she pointed out, the hard labor of other people and, and what their families have done and how they have built wealth. And you want me to give you my wealth, uh, you know, and my family has earned this. And the reality is, is that we have built this nation with our sweat and tears and hard labor, what, to give it to somebody else. And when you start talking about equal opportunity, equal justice, people act like we begging for something that we have never had a right to own and that, and that we are just standing on the sideline watching history go by and not participating in this process. And others have, have benefited from the wealth, have benefited from the opportunities, have, have been able to enter these institutions and these universities that we have been denied entrance to. You know? And for so long, our black colleges didn't even quote count when you talk about uh, admissions to other universities or graduate schools and so forth and so on. They didn't even count despite the brilliance of the folks, they didn't even know what these places were. And so we have continued to, to create and to, to reinvent ourselves uh, and it's interesting that, like I said, at this point, when you look at the wealth factor, and we have so little wealth, so little wealth, despite all the so-called uh, athletes and movie stars that we have, we still, as a collective, have very little wealth, you know. And then when we decide we're going to mass take that wealth and turn it into something else, there are rules and regulations that prevent us from owning football teams and basketball teams and other teams that that expand our wealth, you know. So you can have wealth, but it's limited to the ownership of a big house somewhere and a bunch of cars, okay? And, and not much else and not translated into the power that, that determines not only what you do, but what others do as well. And too often we have not realized that that power is, is, is ex extremely important in determining not only their future, but the future direction of this country and those who are going to run the country. And so we have to, you, we have to begin to rethink economics, but we have been denied access denied opportunity to move into those arenas that we rightfully deserve, where we rightfully deserve to be. And one can only imagine what life would have been like if we had had 40 acres. Yeah, as precious as land was, one can only imagine what the world would look like if we had 40 acres and an equal opportunity to succeed. An equal very opportunity. Very powerful words. Mm. No, very powerful words. Thank you, Dr. Weber. And uh, Professor Marshall, if you can help uh, bring us home. Yeah. Uh, and I know we're trying to condense literally 400 years of American history in an hour and a half. So it's not the easiest thing to do. But if you can uh, just kind of help us summarize this third time period, the post-World War II uh, and civil rights. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best and I'll try to be brief so we have some time for comments. So, you know, when World War II started, thanks to Woodrow Wilson, every part of the federal government had been segregated. So, of course, we're fighting this war and the 92nd Division, the Black Division, is segregated but sent all over um, to combat atrocities in Europe. The only other group that incurred as a percentage of the population as many casualties as African-American or more were the Japanese-American Nisei uh, troops. They were often sent into battle first, followed by the 92nd Division. As my father who fought in World War II said, we were fodder, the Japanese and the African-Americans. Okay, so we come back from this war that's supposed to be promoting democracy and ending bigotry, and we pass the GI Bill. And the GI Bill is given credit for a huge expansion of the American middle class, right? But it was a white expansion. Now, what did the GI Bill do? It allowed for um, uh, veterans to go to college free or with very, very little payment. And it also provided low interest loans to people to buy homes, to invest in farms, and to start businesses. And also provided great sums of money to developers like Levitt of Levittown and the person who developed Westlake in Daly City. But what we are never told is that the federal government required those developers not to sell to African-Americans. And in fact, they could not even build within 10 miles of a black community. This is our federal government. 
It's then bolstered by the banks that rate uh, loans based on neighborhoods. Any neighborhood that had more than 25% Blacks were given a C, and if you had more than 50% Blacks, you were given a D, and C and D ratings meant you got no loans. And then you had the National Realtors Association that put out a handbook that said, in order to join our association, you must not bring in new people that would change the ethnic makeup of any um, neighborhood. So as we were just talking about wealth and education and land, you have this GI Bill that basically helped returning white veterans to become homeowners. And let's look at some of the numbers. In 1950, 69 loans out of 70,000 that were given by one of the GI Bill home loan programs, 69 out of 70,000 went to non-whites. That's 0.01% and that's all non-whites. In 1984, the time that most GI Bill mortgages matured, seven out of 10 whites owned homes compared to four out of 10 blacks. That statistic remains the same in 2021. In 1984, the median net worth of whites was about 39,000. For blacks, it was $3,397 or 9.9% of white wealth. In 2010, the median net worth for whites was 110,000. And despite the Jay-Z's and Oprah's, the median wealth for blacks was $4,955. A decrease from the 1984 median wealth of over 50% and only 4% of what the median wealth of whites are. This is the financial legacy of this 400 year policy of denial. Um, meanwhile, on another front, you had the brilliant jurist, Charles Hamilton Houston, the former Dean of Howard, working with his students, including Thurgood Marshall, to try to dismantle Brown, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson by taking on small cases that first chipped away at salary inequality among white and black teachers, and then the lack of professional schools for black candidates until they brought about Brown in 1954, right? But what was also happening was a grassroots civil rights movement. And unlike the violence of the beginning of the 20th century, we now have TV. So the brave mother of Emmett Till decides to show the world the mutilated body of her 14 year old son for allegedly flirting with a white woman. And we saw the jubilation when his murderers were set free. You also now have the scenes of dogs and hoses attacking young people who just wanna sit at lunch counters. You see the deaths of civil rights workers who were just trying to register voters. So I think very much like the Black Lives Matter movement today, technology played a huge role in what finally led to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, right? And that's supposed to now, like Reconstruction, bring equal opportunity in voting, housing, employment, accommodations. And it is soon eviscerated in a more sophisticated way, but it's eviscerated. What was supposed to bring about substantive equality, meaning our lives change, became formal equality. Oh, if the process is fair, then it's fine, even if our lives haven't shifted at all. What was once affirmative action became reverse discrimination, right? And so you have the Shelby case that essentially says, we don't need those voting right protections, meaning that if there is a violation, you have to bring an expensive voting rights lawsuit. And what happened immediately after Shelby, all of these voting restrictives, restrictions were put back into place. So just like after Reconstruction, we had this period of the modern civil rights 
um, era, but it was undone in the same sort of, if they were more sophisticated ways. And quite honestly, like reconstruction brought us Jim Crow, Obama, I think brought us Trump. That was the other reaction, just like the farmer demanding you pay or black Tulsa, there's no way America was going to allow a black president's legacy to go without a backlash. And so here we are. Thank you so much, Professor Marshall. Somehow you miraculously got us through 400 years of history uh, in uh, just uh, over an hour. Uh, and I know we're running out of time. I want to give each of the panelists an opportunity to uh, just give a thought as to why what we just did here, and I know we didn't have enough time to get through everything, is so important and why it is dangerous for all these states to ban the conversation that we had tonight. And Dawn, I'm going to start with you. If you can explain to the audience and if you could speak to these state legislatures that want to prevent and make it legal what we just did tonight, why this conversation is so important. From my personal experience, it's so important because um, history is enacted on this very broad stage and in the narrow individual life. And what happens for, let's, let's just address well-meaning people um, who are perhaps too complacent in what's going on. It's easy when you're in the majority race to live in this narrow perspective. And that's what happens. So you can think, well, slavery is done and it has nothing to do with me. It happened in the South, not in the Midwest where my family is. <clears throat> but in fact, in a very real way, we are all living on that 160 acre parcel and we now need to figure out what to do with it and we need to broaden that lens and i know that others <laughs> the rest of the panelists for sure have had to have a much broader view of this because their lives their security their jobs depended on it mine did not and so it's easy to fall into this narrow perspective but let me suggest that a simple exercise that worked so well for me is just Pick out something in your history of importance, the mortgage you got, the house you inherited, and just ask yourself, what if I had been born Black? That's it. And let me suggest that those legislators who are right now trying to outlaw this discussion cannot prevent me from asking myself that question and examining my personal history and then sharing that information most importantly with other white folks. Thank you so much, Don and Professor Marshall. Uh, and then we'll go to Professor Weber. Uh, can you uh, add your thoughts to why this conversation that we had is so important? Because until we admit and know our history, we cannot repair the damage we've done. And these little piecemeal uh, attempts um, are not working. And we are going to be a majority minority country. And we have to deal with our structural racism to have the kind of remedies in future that will make us successful. And the head in the sand approach, um, besides causing suffering and suffering and unfairness has proven to be completely ineffective. Thank you so much, Professor. And, and Dr. Weber, if you can take us home and if you could send a message uh, of why this is important, uh, why we need to continue this conversation, um, please do. You know, I, I think we, we saw a lot of it in terms of what's been happening recently out of people, out of ignorance and frustration. And uh, I often say to folks that, you know, if you, if you believe in this democracy that exists in its idealistic sense, it's going to demand of you a change, a critical change. You know, the reality is they tell us that a person who has no knowledge of history is doomed to make the same mistakes over and over again. And that is so true. You know, people don't see the small micro, the microaggressions that exist. They don't see the, the, the shift in voting right laws and rules because they choose not to. 
They think, uh, you know, they, in the same way folks thought literacy tests were, were a good thing that might uh, get a more intelligent quote unquote voter uh, when they knew it was a racist uh, proposition. It's the same thing that's happening right now with the voting rights uh, activities that are occurring and trying to make it harder for people to vote in and more difficult for people to, to do absentee ballots and, and stand in lines and anything else that's there that, that is there. So, you know, the reality is people have to know, they have to know their history. And once you understand that and you understand how, how long this journey has been to get us to the place where we are, we ought to be fighting vigilantly to keep it. You know, I've been telling folks about the Voting Rights Act and in the office, in the Secretary of State's office, we plan to have a number of town halls and discussions about the Voting Rights Act to empower people, uh, not just in California, but across the nation to really understand this long journey of what voting rights mean and how powerful it is. But I tell folks, in the same way it has taken us all these years to climb this very difficult hill that has cost a lot of people their lives in, in the process, when you get there, it is easy at the top of the hill to fall down simply by a misstep on a rock or a twist of an ankle. And the journey down is faster, much faster and more powerful and more dangerous than the struggle going up. And we have to understand that. And we have come a ways. We're there, not there completely, but we cannot become sleep and indifferent to what is going on, we have to be vigilant. And that is so very true. I tell everybody in the assembly that, you know, I have a basic philosophy about um, justice and freedom and equality and all those kind of things. I say they're rare flowers that have to be consistently uh, uh, watered and nurtured and given sunshine and protected. But hatred, discrimination, lying is a weed and it grows best in neglect. And to turn our face against the truth and allow these things to fester, we'll find ourselves with more problems than we've ever had before. So I encourage everybody to be vigilant, to be informed, to be very knowledgeable, and to work to protect what we have achieved and to get even more. So I really thank you for, for the opportunity to be with you this evening. And I know that this is a conversation that has to happen, but it has to happen over and over and over again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weber. And before we wrap up, uh, Adrianette, I know we ran out of time. We got through 400 years in an hour and a half. But did you have any final thoughts or message of why we need to continue this conversation before we conclude today? Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Professor Marshall, Dr. Weber, Don Schock, and everyone who put this together. Um, thank you to CLA and to all of our wonderful partnering organizations this conversation is very important. The facts are there. The economic disparity is there. The institutional um, inequality is there. So, you know, looking at the facts and examining the facts were so powerful. And um, Professor Marshall, we had several people that requested the statistics. Um, um, so we would love to get that. Um, Terrence, we had several people that would really like the slides. And so Don's article um, on homesteading was actually in our racial justice committee um, issue. And uh, that information is there. So uh, Terrence and uh, Professor Marshall, we will be uh, looking for those informations. Um, and thank you so much to, to you, Dr. Weber, for your tireless commitment, not only to education um, and to your constituents, but your, your commitment to equity and excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrianette, and thanks to all the attendees. This was just part one in a series. Uh, we're gonna continue the conversation, uh, but this uh, wraps up our program for this evening. And thanks again to our amazing speakers, Professor Marshall, Dr. Weber, and, and Don Schock. Uh, we love you and appreciate you and Adrianette. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.